Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on all of these occasions on our heritage.org website. Would ask everyone here in-house to make that last courtesy check that your cell phones have been turned off. It will be most appreciated. Uh, we will, of course, post the program within 24 hours on the Heritage homepage for everyone's future reference, and our Internet viewers are always welcome to send questions or comments to us at any time, simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. Hosting our discussion this afternoon is our co-host for today's event from the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, Dr. Lee Edwards, who serves as chairman. He is also Heritage's Distinguished Fellow in Conservative Thought, part of the B. Kenneth Simon Center for Principles and Politics. He is widely regarded as the historian of the American conservative movement. To prove that, he's written 20 or more books, including biographies of many of the prominent conservative leaders of this century, as well as many of the organizations that have led it. He previously served as the founding director of the Institute on Political Journalism at Georgetown, also was a fellow at the Institute of Politics at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, was a media fellow at the Hoover Institution, and is a member of and past president of the Philadelphia Society. Please join me in welcoming my <clears throat> colleague, Lee Edwards. Lee? <clears throat> well, thank you so much, John. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the, the Heritage Foundation. Among all the nations of Eastern and Central Europe, no country has taken more seriously and been more successful than Hungary in negotiating the enormously difficult transition from communism to democracy and a command economy to a market economy. Now, there are many reasons for Hungary's signal success, including its geographical location in the middle of Europe its natural resources, its history as a great European power for centuries, its highly educated, cultivated people, and its unswerving commitment to liberty, the last being a most important characteristic. You see that the Hungarian Revolution of 1956 was no accident. It demonstrated man's unquenchable thirst for freedom and it's a fact that the first tear in the Iron Curtain came when Hungary began taking down the barbed wire along the Austrian border in the spring of 1989. And in June of that year, there was the public reburial of Emery Nagy, executed for his leading role in the 1956 revolution, before a giant crowd of some 250,000 people gathered in Hero Square a young man named Viktor Orban called on Soviet troops to leave Hungary. Today, that young man is the prime minister of Hungary. Yes, Hungary is a remarkable country with remarkable people, like Joseph Pulitzer, Edward Teller, Elie Wiesel, and our speaker this afternoon. Officially, Tibor Navratilovic is the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister of Public Administration and Justice of Hungary, but he's much more than that. And I'm going to try to embarrass him as much as I can. He's already <laughs> smiling. That's good. We want to embarrass our guests as best we can. He's also a political scientist who was taught at the University of Vesprem, a lawyer and jurist, a writer who has been published in the Wall Street Journal and the Independent of London, a member of parliament who wrote the manifesto for his party, chief of the president's cabinet, and for the past three years, the deputy prime minister of Hungary. Who better then than he to describe the role that Central Europe plays in the Atlantic Alliance, still a major factor in the economic and strategic decisions of the United States? Who better than he to explain that the countries of Central Europe are among America's best friends, and are eager to cooperate to bring about a more just, democratic, and free world. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our speaker, Deputy Prime Minister Tibor Navaric. Thank you very much. I'm really embarrassed, so thank you very much. <laughs> God has absolutely succeeded. Um, the title of, of my introduction 
or our contribution is the Central European Indispensable Region, which is not an astonishing title. Regarding that, I came from Central Europe, so of course everybody is regarding their own region as an indispensable region. But uh, the, the real reason why we chose that title is that uh, the feeling um, that we, we feel uh, the Central European region is somehow missing from the American strategic thinking, the missing from the American foreign policy planning and uh, foreign policy uh, agenda. And uh, as an introduction, just prior to the Q&A session, and of course I'm, I would be happy to answer your questions after my introductory remarks. Uh, as an introduction, I would raise three points uh, of observation why Central Europe is indispensable region uh, for, for the United States and for the US diplomacy. And uh, I'm not talking about exclusively Hungary. This is my decision because uh, I think uh, that Hungary is, is really an interesting example and uh, interesting model of the, of the problems of uh, democracy, democratic transitions, uh, the rule of law, how to restructuring, uh, how to restructure uh, institutional frameworks, how to build up new policy agendas and, and uh, institutional setups. But uh, what is more important for us and uh, for my government, for the Hungarian government, is uh, to, to leave uh, a sign, to leave a mark on the American foreign policy thinking that Central Europe is a living and important region. And every country of that region could be crucial uh, for you and uh, for, uh, for the fate of democracy worldwide. So let me just uh, talk about my, my three points of, uh, of departure in my uh, argumentation. The first one is uh, Central Europe is indispensable region from the point of view of the balance of power in Europe. The second one is um, that uh, Central Europe is an indispensable region because it is an interface region and uh, um, you should think about the role of the interface, reg interface regions uh, in Europe and in other parts of the world if you want to, uh, to realize the, the plans of the US diplomacy. And the third one is uh, Central Europe is an um, indispensable region just because it is a success story from the point of view of democratization, from the point of view of building up a market economy, and it can serve as a model for other parts of, of the world uh, if you uh, would like to, to pose a model or a, a, a path for democratization or building up and making uh, market economies stronger. So as for, the first, as for my first point, um, Central Europe is an indispensable region from the point of view of balance of power in Europe. We, we really had uh, happy moments after the democratic transition when uh, Hungary and other Central European countries just uh, went out from the Russia's uh, sphere of influence and we felt the freedom with the support of American diplomacy. You know that there are iconical moments of the American diplomacy, just like George Bush's speech on the Kosciut Square uh, in 1989, or, uh, or the first visits of American politicians, congressmen, and diplomats in, in Hungary and in Central Europe, uh, the first prizes uh, which um, 
was uh, devoted to, to Central European politicians, just like Václav Hava or, or Lech Wałęsa or other iconic figures and heroes of the Central European transitions. But we just um, feeling in the past uh, few years that uh, we are simply, we have simply vanished from the American uh, screen of the foreign policy because there are no American visits in Central Europe. If there are some, those are mostly some educational training programs for democracy, for rule of law in otherwise stable democracies. Uh, there are some ideological assessments about the state of the Central European democracies while there are no reason for concerns regarding the development and stability of the democracy in, in Hungary or in Czech Republic or Slovakia or, or Poland or even in Croatia or, 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 or Slovenia. But there is no proper support for the Central European democracies. But Central Europe matters from the point of view of uh, the balance of powers. Just because uh, Europe is a field of a uh, sphere of influences. And uh, we've just learned during the Cold War that uh, uh, there are sphere of influences. There are uh, no no man's lands in Europe. If there is no American presence in a given country or in a given region, there will be a Russian presence or other countries' presence in those countries. So that's why um, the new chapter of the American diplomacy, uh, which, is, which can be labeled the reset with the relations with Russia, is, uh, means simply the vanishing American influence, political influence, and vanishing American leadership in Central Europe. If the American leadership is vanishing, then, of course, the Russian leadership, there is a possibility that the Russian leadership is growing in that region. In economic investments, in economic influence, but after the economic influence, there could be political influence as well. So if there's no American presence in Central Europe, there could be a Russian presence in Central Europe, which means it can influence, basically, the balance of powers in Europe. We now are living in pretty normal times and, and stable times in Central Europe, but we witnessed uh, several turmoils in the history, several political conflicts, suddenly changing situations in the power balance. And in, from, the point, from this point of view, Central Europe plays a crucial role in the balance of powers in Europe. The second one, which is connected to the first one. Central Europe is an interface region. Interface in the terms of cultural regions or cultural influences. Uh, Central Europe lies just at the crossroad of the Western Christianity, the Eastern Christianity, and uh, a small but strong Muslim influence. You know that Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, as a state entity is a stronghold of the Muslim Turkish influence in Europe. That means that uh, we are witnessing, on the one hand, the conflicts of cultures. On the other hand, we've learned how to handle these conflicts in the past thousand years. We have experts in handling those conflicts, and we have the expertise in handling those conflicts. But uh, as we can see, the United States doesn't want to use those experts and those expertise uh, in handling those issues. And as a result, the United States alone cannot handle those issues. The weakest point or the uh, least stable points uh, from the point of view of stability in Europe uh, can be found in the Balkan Peninsula. If you would like to stabilize the whole European continent, if you would like to make a stable and keep up 
a stable and prosperous continent, uh, you have to solve and you have to settle the problems of the Balkan Peninsula. And we are the gatekeepers of the Balkan Peninsula. Hungarians, Romanians, Croatians, all the uh, nations of Central Europe uh, know exactly all the problems, the languages, the heritage, and the cultural uh, peculiarities of the Balkan people. So that's why Central Europe could be a crucial region for you in handling the problems of the Balkan Peninsula. And as for the, my third point, uh, Central Europe is a success story. Sometimes in the political science and, uh, and in transitology, uh, handles this, the, the story of the Central European countries as a comparable um, cases to the South European countries, Spain, Portugal, Greece, and, and other successful democratic transitions. But there is a, um, a huge dissimilarity between the South European and the Central European cases. Uh, the South European countries made their own democratic transitions without economic transitions, because they were uh, market economies prior to the democratic transitions as well. Uh, Franco, Spain, Salazar's Portugal, even Greece was a market economy, even though from the point of view of the political institutions, it was a dictatorship, uh, uh, while the Central European countries had to make not only political transition, democratic transition, but an economic transition as well. And we were successful in building up um, an absolutely democratic, stable democratic institutional framework, democratic socialization procedures, <coughs> and at the same time, we uh, introduced market economy, introduced and stabilized a market economy. Those examples of the Central European nations can be used in other parts of the world as well, in Cuba, for instance, in North Korea, or in other African or Asian nations, when you want to be prepared for democratic and economic transition as well. We have our own experiences about the traps, about successes, about, uh, about detours, about blind delays, about uh, mechanisms, uh, how can a communist elite convert their own position into uh, a new elite in democratic circumstances, and a lot of small pieces of problems or large projects of democratization which, in which we were successful. So Central Europe, is your, can be your laboratory, living laboratory as well. You can take examples uh, from the Central European nations, and you can take examples from the Central European politicians, because we know it, because we did it. And that's why I think the, the US diplomacy is blind if uh, doesn't take this opportunity and uh, doesn't use the experiences of the Central European nations and politicians. And finally, I know that it's not only a, um, a unilateral game. I mean, it's not only the mistakes of the US diplomacy of this negligence of, of, of Central Europe, because we have our own duty and task as well. We have to redefine Central Europe. Your image is about Central Europe, that there are small, um, small nation states which are always in, in conflict uh, to each other. There is a, a, a strong tendency towards extremism, uh, nationalism, chauvinism. Uh, we are uh, absolutely xenophobic and inward-looking people uh, using the past, the historic past, as a basic argument for our own uh, political argumentations. And uh, it is partly right, of course. We have to we have to redefine ourselves. And that's the point of my government, that we have to build up a new cooperation, a new partnership in Central Europe. We have to avoid all the traps of the, of the uh, Paris treaties, of the uh, way of living and way of thinking of the small nation states. 
And we have to build up a new cooperation based on the Visegrad 4, which can integrate all the nation states in Central Europe, which can harmonize their interests, and which can show up a positive face towards the world and towards the United States of America. Thank you very much. We now welcome your questions. And if I may uh, take the prerogative of the, of the chair, um, and what, what is the relationship uh, between the EU and Central Europe? Perhaps you could address that. Uh, seems to me that uh, certainly is a, is a key question. And, and then we'll be happy to take uh, your questions. Please, if you will, identify yourself. We have a microphone. And uh, let us know what, uh, what you have in your mind. Please. It is a very good question, and it's hard to answer it because uh, um, this is a story. I mean, the relations between the between the Central European countries and and the EU, which uh, somehow encompasses all the all the problems and all the conflicts of the European integration at the moment, because uh, the EU is at a crossroad, I think, uh, partly because of that economic crisis and because of, uh, of the incapable, incapability of the uh, EU institutions for handling uh, that crisis. Uh, the European Union is uh, in a deep identity crisis now. Uh, those eternal questions which uh, accompanied uh, the, the European project from the beginning up till now. Uh, is it possible to, to, to have a European nation, a European citizenship? How can we define uh, the Europeanness? Uh, how can we give democratic legitimacy to the European institutions if there is no European civil society? How can we transpass the, the national diversities and build up a European consciousness just above the national lines and so on and so forth? So all of those uh, problems are um, embodied in the relations uh, between the European institutions or EU institutions and Central Europe. Because uh, we got the EU membership as a, as a huge achievement in uh, 2004. And it was uh, not a departure for us, but an arrival that finally, as a historical achievement, Hungary and other Central European countries uh, became European countries. Uh, in, we are in, in, a, in a secured position because uh, we are NATO members, we are EU members, so there must be no problems in the future. Moreover, we have our own voice uh, in the EU, in the NATO, during decision making. That means that we can represent our interests in the fora of the EU, the European Parliament, the Council, or, or even in the Commission. So we can influence and shape the future of Europe. And that's the biggest chance for, uh, for the Hungarians, for the Slovakians, for, for, for the Czech, or for, for the Poles, uh, to be a part of, of the huge European project. And uh, what we can see is that uh, there is a, a forming um, uniform European vision um, defined by the European Commission uh, at a, a pretty high theoretical level. And if one country cannot adjust his or her own uh, institutional framework to that criteria, it could be, uh, it could be uh, um, a problematic country from the point of view of the future of the, of the European integration. Um, 
There are no exact definition. What does it mean for the European institutions to be a home of rule of law or, uh, or developed democracy? Because these are not uh, exact categories. These are categories or definitions based on political debates. Uh, but the European institutions not designed for political debates. You know that all of them uh, have serious problems. The European Commission has no direct democratic legitimacy. The Council is a, is a body, a political body of the ministers of the member states. The European Parliament has a direct political legitimacy, but the turnout of the European parliamentary elections are uh, extremely low. For instance, in Hungary, it is around 30%, and this is almost the highest in the European Union, because there are 16, 20% uh, turnouts in, in the EU uh, member states. That means that it's not really representative from the point of view of, uh, of the EU members and, and, and the public. And um, there is no consensual definition, and uh, there is no uh, consensual um, conception about democracy at European level. That means that we, we have uh, eternal political debates about, uh, about the nature of democracy, which is natural for us at national level. But uh, if there is no equal possibility for uh, delivering our, our argument or our conceptions about uh, those issues, it's not really natural at European level. And that means that there is a a disillusionment in the Central European uh, countries regarding the EU, because um, some people and more and more people um, see the European integration as not as a as a home and cooperation of the European nations, but as a as an institutional setup, which tries to realize a technocratic vision about Europe, which is not sensitive to the, to the national peculiarities, which is not sensitive uh, to the national solutions, and so on and so forth. We've experienced a lot of um, problems in the past three years just because of the Hungarian experiment, because uh, we've inherited um, a serious political and economic situation in Hungary in 2010. So we had to find some, um, some proper solutions, which, which is not traditional in the terms of the, uh, of the traditional crisis handling or, or general crisis handling, and uh, which raised a lot of concerns in the, in the EU institutions and uh, among some of the member states of the EU. But uh, we are now approaching to the end of that debate. And uh, the result is that uh, some of our uh, solutions became domesticized in other EU member states as well. Uh, step by step, all of the original uh, uh, solutions, all of the original policy reforms became familiar in other EU member states as well. Because we need to be innovative because every country has its own challenges, has its own special problems and conditions, and there is no uniform uh, European solution for the problems of the, of the EU member states. That's why the EU governments has to find their own solutions at national level. But there is a, an, an interesting uh, experiment now is uh, uh, inside the Eurozone to build up uh, a federal institutional uh, setup. And uh, I'm not sure uh, what is the direction in the future of that debate, but that could be uh, a different chapter of the, of the history of the European integration. But at the moment, I would say that uh, almost all of the problems in the relations between the Central European countries and, and the EU it's just because of the specialties of the of the Central European development, the the heritage of the of the communist past, the very poor 
social conditions, the low efficiency of the public administration, and all of the problems which, which are similar or can be seen as similar, but not really similar in a sense. Uh, to the West European uh, countries' experiences. And there is, a, there is an insensitivity uh, in, the, in the EU uh, um, institutions toward the Central European countries' special problems. And that's the problem. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Please, uh, questions? Yes, please. My name is Theodore Byrne. Mr. Deputy Prime Minister, thank you for your remarks. Uh, I have a question about American investment in Hungary. Uh, during the start of the democratic transitions, uh, there were many uh, significant investments by American companies in Hungary, GE's flagship investment in Tungsram, Ford's greenfield operation in uh, Székesfehervár, uh, Sara Lee's investment through uh, Dow Egberts in uh, Compaq, and uh, continuing on for many years. Uh, some, some say now that America's investment interest in Hungary has, has plateaued a bit. And I would welcome your remarks um, as to an American company uh, looking to invest in Hungary as to why it should be an entity that's considered, particularly keeping in mind that Hungary needs to compete. And uh, not only why so Hungary is good, but why it should be considered over other uh, possibilities. Thank you. As far as I know, we have pretty good relations with the American investments as well and, and American investors as well. Although we had some bumpy periods, of course, in, in the first two years uh, after 2010, when uh, we just worked on reshaping the legal environment and, uh, and uh, introducing uh, policy reforms, uh, this period caused uh, uh, a less stable environment for American investors and all other international investors as well. Uh, but I think it's, it's a, it, this situation can be pretty f familiar to, uh, to, other, uh, to other countries' experiences because uh, um, you know that the European economic crisis is, uh, is really deep and has been really deep uh, but uh, Hungary was the first victim of the European economic uh, crisis because while, uh, uh, while the economic crisis or waves of the economic crisis uh, arrived in uh, 2008, autumn of 2008, to Europe, um, in Hungary there was an economic uh, depression even from 2006. So it was a weakened economic uh, uh, system when we get the, the new waves of the crisis, the international waves of the crisis. And that meant that we had to reshape uh, the legal environment and we had to, to introduce new policy steps in order to prepare the Hungarian economy uh, for the competition if, uh, if the European uh, economic recovery uh, it's just starting. Um, and I think uh, it was a, a, a pretty problematic, or it could be a pretty problematic period uh, of the American-Hungarian uh, economic relations. And uh, I, I took part in a lot of discussions with the American investors when they complained about the uh, lack of security, lack of... Uh, um, predictability of the of the legal changes, the political changes, or in the, the changes in the economic policy. But uh, we stabilized the situation. And I think the, the recent Hungary, uh, the Hungary in, in uh, 2013, is more competitive than it was earlier. It was in, in 2010. So it is a better business now for the American investors than it was uh, prior to um, to the elections, and uh, and I really hope that the the European recovery uh, will show up some some new signs of of new investments, uh, and uh, it 
would be mirrored in the in the Hungarian economic recovery as well. So we are absolutely partners. We we made a lot of agreements, so-called strategic agreements, with international companies, a lot of American companies among them, uh, which is a basis for for planning for the for the distant future as well. And we are really thinking seriously uh, about that strategic partnership. We know that the Hungarian economy is uh, is paralyzed without the international part of, the, of that economy. Thank you. Mm. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. My name is Melit Repa and uh, Mr. Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, I have another question concerning the role of the European Union, but I will be maybe a little bit more specific. According to our personal analysis, what will be the future importance of the Central European countries in the European Union? And according to you, do you think that for the Central European countries will be ever as influential as, for example, France or Germany are within the European Union? Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I think the future role of, of the of the Central European countries is uh, is promising, at least for me. But uh, at the very beginning, we have to 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 put together the Central European countries because even the uh, the composition and even the border lines of the Central European region is not not very clear now. The the most promising definition is that the Central European countries are identical with the Visegrad four countries. But if you uh, look at the Visegrad four countries, uh, we can see that uh, there, are, there is at least one country which is somehow um, overplaying other Visegrad four countries, and that is Poland because of the size, because of the uh, population, amount of the population, because of the economic uh, strength and economic size, um, Polish aspirations and Polish ambitions are really outreaching for the, from the Central European region. And it's pretty clear that the Polish diplomacy uh, wants to play a bigger role inside the EU and in the EU decision-making um, fora, they, uh, uh, they equal themselves with, uh, with Spain, sometimes with France, with Italy. I mean, uh, they are in an upper division than, than the Czech Republic, Slovakia, or Hungary because, because of this, the sheer size of the country. Otherwise, I think uh, it, uh, it is... Um, um, a basic interest for the Polish diplomacy uh, to keep Visegrad countries as a political background for them diplomatic aspirations. So that's why I'm optimistic uh, regarding the future of the Visegrad four countries because I think Poland's place is at least partly is in the Visegrad countries uh, uh, cooperation and in Central Europe. But the second question is uh, uh, whether we have to expand this Visegrad Four cooperation to the uh, Croats and the Slovenians. You know, historically, traditionally, Slovenia and Croatia had been a part of Central Europe, the Austro-Hungarian monarchy uh, for almost 800,000 years. So there's a lot of arguments which suggest that uh, Slovenia's and Croatia's place in Central Europe as well. Even their own self-definition is uh, placing uh, their own countries in Central Europe, not in the Balkan Peninsula, uh, just as a switch in, in the geopolitical um, commitment. Uh, the third question, uh, what about the Baltic states? Are those uh, states a part of Central Europe or not? At, at first glance, I would say that uh, uh, they are not part of, of the Central European cooperation. They are part of the Nordic cooperation. The fourth question is, uh, what about Romania, at least Romania, or Romania and Bulgaria and Serbia? Are those countries a part of, of the Central European uh, uh, cooperation or not? 
in my personal opinion, at the moment, they are not part of that Central European cooperation. So if we take the recent Central European uh, cooperation, the Visegrad 4 uh, cooperation, I would, uh, I would liken it to the, uh, to the Benelux cooperation. And I think that uh, the future role of the Visegrad 4 cooperation could be the same as the Benelux cooperation now. I mean that uh, if there are big players on the scene, Germans, French, uh, the UK, um, there could be a um, um, mediating role for the Visegrad four countries, mediating between the interests of, of France and Germany and working on a, a consensual solution, a consensual proposals, and so on and so forth. And on the other hand, advocating the national interests of the Visegrad four countries, because we have a lot of uh, common uh, points of national interest we, which we have to advocate, and it's more efficient if we, if we advocate it uh, uh, together as a, as a stabilized cooperation. And uh, uh, from this point of view, I think um, the Visegrad four countries can be, in normal circumstances, uh, honest brokers, in the EU and in extraordinary uh, uh, circumstances, they can be sometimes political leaders of a compromise or a consensual um, um, solution when there is no agreement between the big players. On the other hand, and this is partly an answer uh, to your second question, I don't think uh, the Central European countries can be in the same position as France or, or Germany just because just because of, of the numbers, of the size, of the strength of those countries. Uh, the Central European countries uh, can be uh, in, uh, in best situation uh, middle players in the EU. And regarding the fragmentation of the EU, which means that we have a lot of mini states and we have a lot of small states, this position is a, is a pretty good position because uh, the access to the EU institutions give us the chance to represent our national interests in Europe, which was never been the case, which has never been the case earlier. I mean, this is a huge achievement. The, EU, the membership in the EU is a, is a huge achievement of the Central European democratic processes. And uh, it's, it is an absolutely good thing. And, and uh, we have to use these channels and we have to use these instruments in advocating and, and representing our national interests. Thank you. Yes, please, uh, over here. Please, yes. Mm -hmm. right, you were saying. Hi, uh, thank you for coming to speak with us today. My name is Rachel Wien. I work for a consulting firm right down the road, the Charles Group. Um, so to expound upon the point that you were making that um, you're not really a big player, uh, none of the countries are big players in the EU, uh, but earlier you mentioned that you're the only ones capable of deconflicting the Balkans. And I was wondering, I don't know if this is sort of irrelevant and not really your line of, or your area of expertise, but I was wondering, what partnerships do you have in place or initiatives that you might have in place in the Balkans to combat uh, drug and human trafficking and how that affects Central Europe? Mm. We have uh, international agreements and uh, we have uh, European legal uh, instruments for, uh, for precluding human trafficking. But in effect, it is, a, it is an issue of, uh, of uh, border patrolling and, uh, and the defense lines along the borders, the Schengen uh, zone and the problems of the, of the Schengen zones. You know that Hungary is the easternmost country of the Schengen zone. That means that the eastern frontiers of, and the southern frontiers of, of Hungary are Schengen frontiers as well. And we have uh, a lot of problems uh, with uh, human trafficking, uh, with illegal migration, uh, just because uh, all the other neighboring countries, uh, mostly Serbia, and to a, less, uh, ex to a lesser extent, uh, Romania, 
uh, cannot uh, preclude uh, those uh, those criminals and, and those gangs. And we've got a, a lot of support from the EU institutions for that. Um, but uh, but uh, it's, a, it's a pretty difficult task to solve. And uh, there's going to be another problem if Croatia uh, joins the EU because of the borders with, with Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, long borders with, with Bosnia-Herzegovina. Uh, it's another uh, issue and question of the Schengen uh, zone. There's a lot of debate about the efficiency of the of the Schengen agreement and the uh, the Schengen zone. Just for instance, I think last year uh, Denmark uh, was thinking about uh, leaving the Schengen zone and uh, reintroducing uh, the border patrol just because of the uh, inefficiency of the of the Schengen mechanism. But um, but we have to solve it at European level, I think. Mm. My name is Inchi Bowman, and I was wondering whether you could briefly comment on the multi-ethnic co composition of Hungary, Hungarian population. And more specifically, I would like to ask you about the Hungarian diaspora. Uh, we outside of the about, country? Yes, outside, outside of Hungary. Uh, we hear these stories here and there, you know, like Romania and mm. Ukraine and maybe other countries. Yes. What is your policy toward the Hungarian uh, diaspora? Yeah. We are a world nation. That means that there's a lot of Hungarians outside of Hungary, uh, partly, partly because of uh, uh, their own personal decisions. For instance, in the United States, there's a, there are a lot of uh, Hungarian communities living here. Voluntarily, they just settled down here. And, uh, and uh, we have uh, uh, pretty good relations with them as well. But we have obligations to other Hungarian communities. Uh, they are living along the Hungarian borders because of the Paris Treaty in 1920 when, uh, when uh, uh, the, the provisions of the Paris Treaty left a lot of Hungarian communities outside of the Hungarian frontiers. In Transylvania, in, in Romania, in Vojvodina, in Serbia, in northern part of, of Serbia, and in southern Slovakia. Uh, it was, uh, according to estimations, uh, in the interval period, it was a five million uh, population. Now it is less. And uh, we have uh, approximately two, two and a half million Hungarians along the borders outside of Hungary. Um, what we, and it is a, a constitutional obligation of the Hungarian government to take care of the, of the Hungarian communities. I mean, take care in terms of, of cultural relations, uh, supporting uh, the, the national identity uh, of, of that communities and helping, helping them in, uh, in keeping up uh, cultural, uh, cultural institutions and so on and so forth. But we've adopted a new law in uh, 2010 uh, about the Hungarian citizenship, which made uh, easier for the Hungarians outside of Hungary to gain the Hungarian citizenship. That means voting right as well. So there will be the, the first elections uh, next year when uh, the Hungarians outside of Hungary can vote to the Hungarian parliament by party lists. Uh, this is a symbolic uh, issue, mostly a symbolic issue, but I think uh, that it is important for us uh, to, to keep up the, the strong relations with the Hungarian communities. I think we have time for about two more questions, uh, please. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here and thank you for your friendship. My name is Powell Moore. And my question relates to your relationship with the Russian Federation. What, are you, what is your long-term vision for that relationship? And uh, are you concerned about too much dependence on uh, Russia for your oil and gas resources? It must be a long-term and friendly neighborhood, but I'm really concerned. 
uh, about the Russian presence in in the energy sector and in uh, in the economic sector of some European countries. We know that uh, there are varying levels of of the Russian influence in the EU member states, and uh, most of the EU member states. Uh, uh, had no problems with, with the Russian influence because uh, the Russians are just one of the investors in the economy. But there are some EU member states where there can be strategic problems just because of the of the Russian investments. But uh, but on the long term, I would say that we are convinced to to live together peacefully because uh, it is our interest. I mean, the Central European nations' interest is. The best interest is to be uh, living together peacefully, and that's why I would recommend for the decision makers of the U.S. Uh, foreign policy to support the Central European nations in order to keep up this peaceful coexistence with Russia. Yes, please over here, uh, gentlemen. My name is uh, Thomas uh, Teglashi. I'm a Hungarian-American. I am vice president of the American-Hungarian Federation. Uh, the question I would like to pose relates to the Hungarian minorities that you, are, you already talked about. But what what I think is perhaps the most important issue or the most important question is uh, how do you see the future? Now, there are other places in Europe where minorities have had problems, namely in the United Kingdom with Ireland, in Spain and southern France with the Basques, and then there are marvelous examples like Switzerland. Now, um, I would think that the future of the area, of the Central European area, would benefit by resolution of the minorities question. And, and uh, the the entire area could better focus and concentrate on uh, assisting the European Union and, and the area if their minority issues were fully resolved. How do you see the immediate and long-term future of that? When, when, can, when can permanent solutions be hoped for? And in, in what direction are things moving with regard to autonomy and uh, other possible ways of uh, resolving the problems? Thank you. Uh, although the, the fundamental charter of human rights of the European Union uh, acknowledges the freedom for national identity and identity of the national minorities, Unfortunately, it's not on the agenda of the EU. Uh, just because the EU's original definition is, a, is an economic union or economic community, and uh, every political dimension or political point or, or point of identity which can create a genuine European community is strictly avoided so far. But uh, I think uh, it's, it, is a, it is a matter of fact that, that minority issues in Europe is gaining more and more importance, just like in the United Kingdom, as you can see uh, in the, in the uh, problems of Scotland, uh, statehood of Scotland and, and secession of Scotland, uh, or, or uh, in Spain, in Catalonia and in Central Europe as well. So the real issue in Central Europe is uh, the territorial autonomy for the Hungarian minorities. And <clears throat> because we can see positive examples for handling 
the minority issues in, in the West European countries. For instance, in, in Finland, the Swedish minorities, territorial autonomy in the Oland Island. Or in, in, in Italy, the South Italian solution for the territorial uh, autonomy uh, for the German-speaking community there. Or, or in, Basque, in the Basque country, uh, in, uh, in Spain. Uh, that suggests that territorial autonomy is a viable solution for, for handling ethnic conflicts. On the other hand, in the Central European uh, countries, the territorial autonomy uh, has been equalized by the majority population, I mean Slovakians or Romanians, as a secession separating uh, the Hungarian community from the, from the majority uh, so of the society. Uh, so it's not, for them, it's not a solution. It is a declaration of war. And I think it is a huge problem. Because while we have, in Hungary, we have a, a very strong and broad definition of cultural autonomy of the minorities living in Hungary. They have their own self-government uh, system uh, from the local level up to the, to the national level. We have uh, Roma uh, self-government, uh, minority self-government, Slovakia minority self-government, Serb um, uh, minority self-governments, and so on, so on, so on, so forth. Um, in Romania and in Slovakia, even in Serbia, a territorial autonomy is a, is, a, is a serious problem, domestic political problem for the majority of the population. So we have to convince them that it's not a problem, it's a part of the solution. If there is a, a Hungarian population which, uh, although it is a minority in the country, but at the given region it, is a, it could be a, a majority, it is probably uh, the best solution for them to decentralize or de devolute the, the uh, central power to the local communities and they can localize ethnic problems and they can solve the ethnic problems with that solution. But it's, mm. it's the question of the future, I think. Thank you. Mm. I do have one last question and that is, uh, Mr. Prime Minister or Deputy Prime Minister, uh, will you be going to the Hungarian Folk Festival? <laughs> tomorrow, yeah. yes. tomorrow uh, actually tomorrow at 11 a.m. I will open the, the Smithsonian Folklife Festival. You can find the programs, the leaflets of the programs in, in the exit, I think, so just pick up and, and uh, you're absolutely welcome to the opening ceremony. Is Thank that you very why much. you're here? Mm -hmm. Yes. That's, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, so. I'm here because of the Heritage Foundation, yeah. just <laughs> occasionally there is the opening ceremony of the Smithsonian Folklife Festival. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in applauding. <laughs> Marvelous presentation. Marvelous.